like to introduce everyone to Dr. Leslie Kilmartin. Um, uh, Leslie was a former Dean and Pro Vice Chancellor at La Trobe University until 2003. Uh, and following that, he was a human resources consultant over the past several years. He has researched the life of William Cromarty, his third time great grandfather. He's recently published a novel, The Cromartys of Port Stevens, and a biography, The Elusive Captain William Cromarty. Um, so uh, Leslie is uh, zooming in from Melbourne. Um, he was hoping to be up here mm. along with his family who are currently zooming in today. Um, and there's a whole list of them here <laughs> that are hopefully online as well. Ooh. And I'd like to thank uh, Robert Watson for his assistance. Yeah. Over to you, Leslie. Thanks very much, Johnny. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to go to share screen, which uh, I understand is the next thing to do. Uh, wait, and I have to share. Um, anyway, uh, I do, uh, I've listened with great interest to Richard's presentation and how I envied him having a diary. Uh, if, if my three times great grandfather, William Cromarty had kept a diary, my life might have been uh, a lot easier, but perhaps a lot of other people would beat, have beaten me to the story uh, if, if there was much that he left behind. He didn't. Uh, and that, in part, accounts for why I've um, entitled this talk The Elusive William Cromarty. Um, this is a, a family history. And before any of you hearing the words family history rush to the leave meeting button, uh, I, <laughs> I'm going to assure you that I'm trying to make it as relevant as possible to this audience. I've looked for the um, Newcastle connections of Cromarty. And uh, I've tried to include some incident, incidents in his life that uh, I think would be of interest to a group like yours. Uh, let me start with uh, some thanks to Anne Hardy for her assistance in setting this up uh, so seamlessly. Uh, she's been very helpful to me. To Joni himself, uh, who uh, perhaps even unwittingly um, helped my research quite significantly when I was in Newcastle almost two years ago, Johnny, remember that? Um, uh, in the archive, um, and he was very helpful to me. And then to Robert Watson, who um, uh, provided me a great deal of technical assistance, and I'm very, very grateful to him, and um, and certain amount of wise counsel. He's almost like a father figure to me, perhaps he's like that to the rest of the group too. Um, I enjoyed my contacts with Robert and, and very, I'm very grateful to him for um, everything he did for me. So William Cromarty, if I've been with you, and I bitterly regret the fact that I'm not, uh, I'm in Melbourne in case uh, I think you perhaps mentioned. Um, I'd love to have been with you, I'm not. Um, I would have asked how many of the group, if they've been present, know the name William Cromarty, and I would suspect not many. And that was because I think he wasn't exactly a local hero in the area, but he had significant um, uh, relationship with contact with uh, Newcastle, Port Stevens. But I also hope um, that he wasn't a local villain, but perhaps that remains to be seen. Um, Yes, he was my three times great grandfather. And uh, in my, um, it led me in my retirement to uh, develop an interest in him. And I, as Joni mentioned, I've written two books. The first is a, a straight biography. It's very academic, about 27,000 words. Um, the Elusive Captain William Cromarty, he was a sea captain. That's the cover of the book. And uh, I'll come back to that illustration later. It's, um, you'll recognize uh, Soldier's Point at Port Stephens, perhaps in the bottom there, and I'll come back to that in a little while, back to that map, in fact, which uh, is, is a very useful one for me. Um, this, this was uh, it based on this Admiralty map, uh, and again, I'll, I'll return to that theme a bit later on. The second book, was, uh, which was actually written first, was a novel. I, I assembled all, everything I could find about Cromarty, and um, I then wrote a, a little novel for my grandchildren, actually. Um, and uh, this is the cover to the novel. Uh, I've recently self-published both of them. Um, and this is the book. I won't talk much about this today, but I thought the cover was fantastic. It's uh, 
a painting by Thomas Whitcomb, a uh, British painter, which is in the, currently in the, in the National Maritime Museum in London, of the ship Phoenix, the convict ship Phoenix, on which Cromarty's wife and two children arrived um, in Sydney more than two years after he first arrived. They arrived in um, 1824, and there was a momentous, um, calamitous um, entrance to Sydney Harbour when that ship, the, the fastest ship of its time, they said, with 200 um, or so uh, convicts on board, hit uh, a rock formation in Sydney Harbour called the Sow and Pigs, some of you might know, and she was uh, uh, there for 24 hours or so before, before being floated off and then never sailed the oceans again, but became, uh, I understand, the first convict hulk in what was then Phoenix Bay, now Lavender Bay. Uh, that's the, the full painting by Whitcomb of the um, of two aspects of the, the ship, the Phoenix. More of, more of her, her later, perhaps. Uh, topics for my talk, um, I want to refer to Cromarty and Soldiers Point, where he had a significant uh, period of time. Cromarty in Newcastle, an indiscretion in Newcastle, and the, the fateful King William incident. So, firstly, um, Cromarty's, uh, the local geography, which you'll be very familiar with as Novocastrians, I suppose, those of you who are, um, you'll see um, on the Karua River where Cromarty had a property in the 1826, 1827, 1828 period. There's a Cromarty Creek. Uh, Stroud was where the company, the Australian Agricultural Company, set up their headquarters in due course after starting at Carrington down on the bay, the harbour. And uh, Cromarty lived and worked for the company at Stroud, where he had a house for a couple of years. Uh, Alderley was the uh, was the horse stud. Uh, Burrell was where Cromarty was near where Cromarty's had, uh, uh, and I'll come back to this in a minute. Had a um, an establishment of some sort, and uh, I think you know the the rest of the geography of that area. So, Cromarty left his mark on um, parts of that uh, area. Here in, you'll see here uh, Cromarty's farm. Just take a, a notice, if you would, where Cromarty's farm is on Soldiers Point. Um, it's over on the west coast. Uh, his farm overlooked Cromarty's Bay, as you can see. Uh, Nelson Bay featured in his um, story later in life. I'll come back to that, as did uh, One Mile a beach down the bottom, and um, uh, up the top you'll see the Karua again. Um, there are other places, uh, I've mentioned Cromarty's Bay, Cromarty Bay Road, Cromarty Creek, uh, Fame, uh, Fame Point and Fame Cove, were, Fame was the name of the ship which Cromarty served on as first officer when he arrived in Sydney in 1822. And in fact, uh, the, the, we'll be having, I hope, a family bicentenary next September for the, to celebrate the arrival in Sydney of Cromarty. Um, near Cromarty's farm are uh, currently Mary Street and Magnus Street, Mary and Magnus being the names of two of the Cromarty children. So in that vicinity, there are quite a few references to the Cromarty family. A quick chronology um, of Cromarty's life. He was born in, in uh, Orkney. Uh, Orkney, as you know, may know, is an a archipelago, a archipelago of about 70 islands uh, to the north of Scotland. You'll see the top of the mainland Scotland there and the island from which they came, both him and his wife, uh, Cecilia or Sissy, um, it was South Ronaldsea. Um, Cromarty was uh, said to be from Kletz. You'll see Kletz uh, there. I, can, I should be pointing. Uh, Cecilia was from St Margaret's Hope, and there was a, a harbour here. Uh, and they were married in St Peter's Church, which featured not only for their their wedding, but the uh, the christenings of uh, two of their children. Orkney Mainland is up here. Uh, he was born on the 25th of November, 1788 and got married to Cecilia on the 26th of November, 
1815. Um, he arrived, I, I have to skip fairly quickly over a, a, a lot of his life, um, but also I don't know much. From his birth date until his wedding, I can find no record whatever. Uh, after his wedding, uh, he moved to London, obviously was based in London with his wife and uh, two children. And, uh, and then there was nothing much there, but I have reason to believe that he was away a lot from London uh, at sea oh. uh, until he um, arrived in, uh, in Sydney in uh, 1822. But, however, that wasn't his first visit to Sydney. He, his first visit to Sydney that I can find was in 1819, when again, as first officer on a much larger ship, the fame was only 164 tons or so, uh, but on, in 1819, he arrived on a, a much larger convict ship, uh, the Tyne, with 200 Irish convicts and military guard and so on. So he was first in, in Sydney from about January 1819, but then returned, obviously, to probably to London. Uh, when, he did, when he did arrive in, um, in uh, Sydney to settle in 1822, he came on the fame as first officer to... A captain, the captain of the fame being John Grimes, the son of Charles Grimes, who is quite well known in, in uh, Victoria too as a, uh, um, as a surveyor, but uh, many of you will know Charles Grimes in a Sydney context. But it's obvious from the records, and there are much better records of his, um, his life uh, from um, shipping records in the colony uh, from 1822 on, when he, he apparently kept working as first officer on the fame and then later as captain of the fame. But he obviously pretty early on fell into the employ of the um, wealthy ex-convict Simeon Lord, whom many of you will also oh. know or know of. And uh, this was a sketch um, from later of Simeon Lord's house in Macquarie Place. Uh, and um, there's another sketch of this house uh, in Grace Carskin's book, which uh, and describes as a four, it's not as, as good as, not as clearly defined a sketch as a four-storey house. I'm not quite sure. This is certainly not a four-storey house, but it was alleged uh, that um, uh, Lord kept the upper level of the house for visiting sea captains and so on. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if Cromedy um, was a regular visitor at Lord's house. And I have reason to suspect that Cromedy had a, a quite a close working relationship. I was going to say with Lord, but it would be certainly before Lord. Oh. Uh, and uh, he, no doubt, um, uh, I think there's no doubt about that. He, he once took Lord's 16-year-old son, Beau, to Tasmania. Uh, Lord had decided that Beau wasn't much of a student at school, and uh, he sent him to Tasmania to... Uh, extend Simeon's uh, Lord's um, a business interest there. But interestingly enough, um, in uh, May 1826, the Cromedies had a, their firstborn child in the colony, and they she was christened at um, the uh, in, in Sydney uh, as Mary Louisa Lord Cromedy. Uh, I'm guessing I shouldn't have to explain why she had a given name Lord. That does suggest a close connection that Mary was the name of Lord's wife and Louisa the name of one of Lord's daughters. So I suspect that there might have been quite a close relationship there. I want to go now to Cromarty and Soldier's Point. Um, in the 18, 1826, 27, 28, Cromarty had a uh, some sort of a property, you'll see here on this um, uh, map of the company, you'll see there Cromedy's hut. And on this map, uh, Cromedy's hut is the only man-made feature we can see. And I don't know anything about it. Um, he was, as a sea captain, taking uh, on the fame, taking cedar gathering uh, groups, cutters, to uh, this area, all around here, I guess, for cedar cutting. Whether that was... Um, a base for him there, but why would it just be a base just up the Karua River? And it was, as it says here, I think somewhere here, the Karua is not navigable about beyond this point. 
uh, navigable for boats to this place. That's about Bural, as I understand it. Uh, I think this might have been uh, uh, part of Cromarty's land grant, which was uh, 300 acres, and I'll come back to that in a little while. In any event, um, as is well known, perhaps to the group I'm speaking to, uh, the Australian Agricultural Company um, in, I think, 1826 was granted a million acres um, uh, on the northern side of the uh, Port Stephens Harbour, and that million acres included Cromarty's farm, and uh, that was um, uh, uh, no doubt presented a difficulty for him. I, I understand that he and the a man called Francis Short and another man called Captain Moon all have properties here, but Cromarty was the only one who'd done anything with his property, and uh, all three tried to dispute um, or to get alternative um, grants, but only Cromarty was given an alternative grant, and that was at Soldier's Point. Um, so um, then Cromarty moved across the bay, took his 300 uh, acres across to um, Soldier's Point here. I guess you're all familiar with that. This Cromarty's Bay again. And this, these, this seems to be the 300 acres of land which they, uh, which he, he had. And um, this name here is Magnus Cromarty. And that, um, uh, although it's misspelled, I think it looks like Margus or something, that it must have been Magnus who was um, Cromarty's uh, son. And that there is... Um, uh, is the date 1915, and that was when the Commonwealth acquired this land for defence purposes in 1915. But by then, of course, 1915 or thereabouts, it was it was a much developed, or perhaps, perhaps a bit more developed than when Cromarty set it up. It was first there. Um, Soldiers Point was so named because uh, on the point, I imagine, um, I imagine, I'm, I'm guessing the soldiers, the soldiers were stationed somewhere here. I'd be very grateful with any of these details, which I'm guessing at, if anyone in the audience um, can clarify any of these issues for me, but soldiers point does suggest the soldiers were here. Were here. Um, and Cromarty's farm was around here. Uh, the dwelling is, I'll come to it later. But uh, I'm grateful to uh, Johnny for um, bringing this particular sketch to my attention. It's just such a ripper, I think. Um, it shows the, uh, this um, sketch of the soldier's camp, but the artists are known. It, it's in Brian Engel's book, which is where uh, Johnny referred me, and I've never seen this before, and no one has ever since uh, brought it, mentioned it to me. So. Johnny, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to you because this is, a, I think, just fantastic. I'd love to know more about the detail and the provenance of the sketch, but uh, inquiries, the, 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 um, the book says, Engels says in the book that, um, that the original is held by the Newcastle uh, Regional Gallery, um, or City Library, I'm sorry. Uh, however, they just don't know it. I've been to the State Library of New South Wales, the National Library, I've asked experts in all kinds of areas, who did this? Uh, can they do it? What can they tell me about it? There's nothing. So if anyone in the audience has any clue at all, I really would love to know. It's, I think it's fantastic. Um, now, the matter of the soldiers' point uh, and the role of the soldiers, the soldiers were stationed there, I gather, uh, in order to intercept runaways from Sydney who thought they could walk to China and runaways from Port Macquarie who wanted to get back to Sydney. Um, one of Simeon Lord's business associates was, was a, a man who strikes me as a very colourful <coughs> chap called Francis Short, S-H-O-R-T-T, the name might be familiar to some of you. He was a surgeon businessman and Francis Short um, might have provided the answer to one of the questions that I have, and that is, why did Cromarty get 300 acres of land as a grant? Short says in another document somewhere that he and Cromarty and Captain Moon got 
their grants of land for, quote, efficient services to the government. But I suspect this was Short's phraseology and not any official uh, um, classification or um, attribution. And Short gives a, a, an interesting account of the role of, of Cromarty and his men, as he calls them, uh, who were in this vicinity. Sorry, was someone to say something? I've got to change the speaker over, so just excuse me a second. Is there somebody there who can tell me when I've gone on too long? <laughs> okay. Can I keep going? Yes, keep going. Okay. okay. Um, according to Short, in his, a letter he wrote to government, the soldiers were not very efficient at intercepting runaways. In fact, to quote him, he says, Cromarty and the people under him have at different times secured runaways and bushrangers. And he goes on to contrast Cromarty's success in this with that of the soldiers, asserting, quote, that Cromarty and his men have secured 197, while the military have secured only three. <laughs> <laughs> but how reliable an informant is, is uh, short? I suspect he was a rather colourful character. But let me read his lurid account of one of these uh, incidents. Um, when he talks about my people at Port Stephens, and remember he was working for Shaw, uh, for Simeon Lord, um, and he's, he refers to my people who very likely were Cromarty and his men, his crews, um, and the runaways from the penal settlement, settlement at Port Macquarie. A quote, he says, I shall mention only two out of many melancholy instances of a party of nine deserters from Port Macquarie, only one man, nearly scalped by the ferocious cannibals, was picked up by our people. Six having been butchered and two drowned in crossing rivers. Of seven others who deserted, only two reached our men. The other five having been killed and eaten, underlined, the two survivors were saved by the women. I take it he means the Aboriginal women. He goes on to say, furthermore, a boat and crew, very likely the fame with Cromedy, were almost always employed in the disagreeable service of conveying these persons, the runaways and bushrangers, to Point Laura, where the military is stationed. Now, so many of you will know Dr. Penny Pemberton, who was at um, the Butler Archive. She points out that um, this was probably Soldiers Point, not Point Laura, but um, she noticed that um, Short's wife was Laura. So perhaps he named Soldiers Point after his wife. Um, so that seems a, a pretty sensible suggestion. And this disagreeable service, Short points out, is free of all cost to government. And he says, what's more, the captors are instructed to ass assert themselves again. I have to go back and do it. So I suspect that Cromedy and his men were, in fact, transporting these people back to Sydney or back to Port Macquarie. Um, now, where was uh, Cromedy's farm? I mentioned earlier, uh, this was another breakthrough that uh, Dr. Pemberton put me on to. I would never have expected that a map done by the British Admiralty would answer this question for me. I've, I've cropped this rather a lot, but you'll remember this is Soldiers Point, which goes north, and the Admiralty map, which was replete with all kinds of navigational information all around the bay, um, was in fact, mm. did in fact show the borders of Cromarty's property, which was, a, again, a wonderful revelation for me. And on there, there were these three buildings. Um, I don't know what they were, but I suspect one was a house, storeroom, and it was alleged that uh, family law has it that Cecilia Cromarty owned, uh, operated for quite a long time, a store, uh, a general store for passing passers by, for sailors who came in and uh, anchored here and uh, replenished their supplies. Over on this side, there was a freshwater well, Johnny's well, um, and it seemed like a, a convenient meeting place. So I, um, very, th this was done some years after, you know, it was done in 1866, but based on, perhaps somebody can help me, an earlier one in the 1850s, I think. But uh, this was obviously still 
um, an indication of where Cromarty's farm was, which is great. Now, to come to Cromarty and Newcastle, um, he had quite an association with Newcastle. The, the shipping records show that he sailed from Sydney to Newcastle and Port Stephens a lot. And uh, he brought back cedar from uh, the Port Stephens area and coal from uh, Newcastle to Sydney. He was often there. And um, he, his daughter was married there in 1833, 34, uh, his eldest daughter, and two of his children were baptized uh, in the cathedral there as was where his daughter was married. But his association with um, Newcastle became a bit more long-standing in uh, 1834 when he accepted an invitation from William Nicholson, the harbour master at Sydney, uh, to the post of uh, pilot at the port of Newcastle. And he commenced that duty on the 12th of October, 1834. And the, uh, uh, let me see, oh, yes, this is uh, Mr. The newspapers reported at the time, Mr. Cromarty, a very old resident of Port Stephens, he would have been about 46 years old then, uh, had been appointed to the situation of pilot at Newcastle. Reports speak very highly of his fitness for the post to which the government has stationed him, being a man of courage and an excellent seaman. Uh, until Cromley's appointment, um, there'd been a rather unsatisfactory situation as far as the pilot is concerned. Um, uh, it had been a Mr Eckford, and I noticed one of our guests today is Mr Eckford, and uh, uh, that seems like a, a likely connection. But... Uh, Immediately before Cromedy was a Mr. Pettit. And Mr. Pettit attracted a lot of criticism for his um, uh, performance in the role. Um, even William Nicholson, the harbour master at Sydney, concluded, quote, that Pettit was very timid and cautious when in charge of large vehicles. Um, and uh, there were other criticisms of him, including by the very influential um, Captain Dumarisk of the uh, Australian Agricultural Company. So Pettit's days were numbered. He was a retired soldier, I gather, and perhaps he didn't have much claim on a role as being a pilot in such a, uh, a dangerous harbour. The Sydney Gazette wrote in March 1834 that in no harbour or river of the colony is the necessity of a pilot more urgent than in that of the hunter. And we gain an insight into the dangerous work of the pilots and their crews from an account about William Atkinson, who was a, a convict, <clears throat> who was assigned to Cromarty, in fact, as part of the boat crew at Newcastle in December 1835. Quote, the pilots and their crew at Newcastle were brave men. They were often called on in the worst of weather to guide vessels into the harbour and were required to perform rescues as well. Their tiny boats were sometimes scathingly referred to as cockle shells. So Nicholson from the, the Harbour Master at Sydney records that Cromedy is the person who was so strongly recommended by Sir Edmund Parry and he would have worked, he did work closely with Parry who by then was um, the commissioner in charge of the company. Uh, and D Dumaresk, Colonel Dumaresk said uh, of Cromedy um, he's represented as a first-rate sailor of sober, respectable habits, great activity and perfect probity. And Nicholson, back to him, says, from the knowledge I have of him, have had of him for some years past, I'm assured that I shall not be disappointed in the opinion I've formed of him as an active and intelligent seaman. I, in my investigations, I came across Charles Martin's wonderful uh, depiction of Newcastle in 1825, and I, Charles allowed me to use any of the stills, and I thank him very much for that, and I hope he's here with us today. Um, you'll recognise this, Nova Castrians and uh, Watt Street uh, Wharf, of course, and I, I like to think of that as could be the fame there, but Charles, perhaps you can confirm that later. I think that if you have, I guess all of you have seen this, it just uh, was a wonderful thing for me to see how he'd recreated uh, Newcastle in 1825. 
So I'm just wondering, Les, we should probably um, start pretty soon just to include a few questions as you can. Okay. All right. Well, I'll skip over. Thanks for the, the warning. Um, um, okay. What I'll do is I'll leave um, my prepared notes and I'll just skip through the rest of the slides. There aren't many. Um, this well, one Charles, Charles is online, though. Oh, good. Excellent. I'm hoping you'll say hello. I don't know if we can hear him, though. I think he's okay. had some audio issues. This is the references written for uh, for him by three very distinguished uh, people uh, for appointment as pilot. Uh, the, the, um, the incident that I referred to was when Cromedy got into trouble for sailing, for taking a man from the beacon uh, in the middle of the night to Smith's Island, which I think might have even disappeared by now. Is that right? Um, anyway, uh, he he went to get a carcass, and uh, he got he had was told by the magistrates that uh, he had no right to take somebody away from their duties uh, at the beacon. And if it ever happened again, he'd be in big strife. Um, all right, coming close to the end, I have to leave aside the, um, the story about the King William incident, but it effectively, in very brief terms, Cromedy was asked in um, uh, August, the end of August, 1838, uh, by Crummer and White, Crummer and White being magistrates in Newcastle, I gather, uh, to retrieve a stern boat which had come, come adrift from the King William as she made away, ran to safety at Port Stephens. And uh, Cromedy, his 16 year old son, uh, an assigned servant called William Catton, or Catton, and what the news called a, 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 a native black. Uh, bush bashed across to One Mile Beach to retrieve the boat, uh, and they were never seen again. Um, Cromedy, some of uh, remains of Cromedy and the others were retrieved, eventually buried by the on the company land um, at Carrington Atali. Uh, so, uh, just to wind up a bit, a few final observations. I think Cromedy's um, experience as a mariner must have been very, very significant. Um, his service at uh, Newcastle was cut short. Who knows where that might have led? And if I could mention just in really in closing, Joni, two gaps which I am very frustrated about in the story. The first is I have absolutely no record of any interactions that Cromedy might have had with Indigenous people. Um, what I've read, uh, you know, concerns me a lot um, about what was going on in those times and what relationships were like. The second major omission is a, a story of his wife because she must have been an extremely um, hardy woman used to separation for long periods of time from her husband. Um, and uh, she went to live on another more than 20 years after he died, uh, running that general store at Soldiers Point. Perhaps, uh, I'll finish at that, that point and see if there are any questions and any leads for me. Oh, maybe I'll just point out that, um, oh, that's the grave of Cecily. Uh, and that is how anybody who wants to contact me can get my email or phone mm. there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz. Okay. I'll have to mention it to... Um, um, Carol Widgeway Bissett, she's a, a Waramai woman. Um, oh, she yeah. might know something in the family histories up there in Port Stephens. I mean, Cromarty is not an uncommon name. I mean, you see it in records pop up all the time. Yes. So um, it's just been really good to learn a bit more about about him and also see what connections there are and yeah for me it's always the uh, aboriginal indigenous connections that really interest me as to what was yes. going on because i guess i guess they were in the same sort of business aboriginal people also being used to to capture um runaways and people yes. that were absconding from newcastle so they're both on the same kind of side Absolutely. but it'd be interesting to see what what other things were going on while you were speaking i was posting up maps um details um, of larger areas that you were mentioning in your talk. Um, interesting to compare the area that Cromarty was living in with the 1826 Ebsworth map that's got all the Aboriginal locations as well. Yes. So that's on the 
Hunter Living Histories page. Yep. But um, any questions that, again, shout out because I can't always see you on Zoom. So apologies if I don't. If um, I don't. Johnny. Yep. Um, just introduce who you um, are. I can't always I'm, see I'm, you. I'm, I'm, I, have, I have. Howard, there you go. Good. Interior interest for other reasons in the time scale. Um, if Cromarty was in Port Stevens in the late 1820s, between say 1826 and 1830, it is highly likely he would have had a relationship or knowledge of Philip King, who is in, I believe, either in charge of or perhaps a senior officer in the military. Oh, yeah. And Philip King was in charge of or managed to take weapon for about four years on the point at Port Stevens. Uh, at the entrance to the harbor. We have records of the weather measurements, but we do not know anything about his other relationships associated with the area in, uh, with that, in the other people in the area. At least we haven't done any research. So I don't know whether that kind of clue is useful to you or not, uh, because you did mention soldiers and soldiers point as well. Yes. Now, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, Howard, um, I, uh, I can't bring it up at the moment, but that Admiralty map which I showed and which appears on the front of the, uh, of the book uh, is in fact a map, I think, done by King, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's good. And with your question about the source of that uh, uh, painting um, being somewhere in the libraries of um, Newcastle, we've got a couple of contacts um, within there. Kerry, did I see you pop up somewhere? Um, hopefully someone might be able to chase it up. It's always mystifying to me when these things get digitised. I, I think the book, Engel's book, came out in the early 90s, so it's always interesting when you're trying to track the sources of where people yes. get things from. Um, but it would yeah. be good to track down the original. Yeah. So did um, Charles... Uh, Brian ever talked to you about it, or that's the best he, he understood? Yeah, I, I, I contacted Brian. Yeah, uh, but he um, he couldn't help. Okay, uh, it was some time ago. Yeah, yeah, and um, he, I think he checked with this one or two of his co-authors, okay, and and no one could throw any light on it. But, oh, okay, um, yeah, it's such a shame. Mm. Yeah, oh, these things depending on on when these things were created, it's always difficult to track track down where people get this get the yeah. material from um, yes. because it's not like it is now I mean back then you had to organize a photographer in to <laughs> photograph this stuff and yes. I mean we take so many things for granted and we forget how the yes. process of actually extracting an image from something was a lot more difficult and um, things yeah. can go astray things got lost um, yes. yeah, so interesting to see if anyone recognizes it did anyone recognize it that's zooming in yeah, add one thing. It could actually be Isabella Parry when you compare it mm. to the um, Newcastle sketch. I'm just trying to find it online, but okay. there's an image in the foreground that has got a similar figure in her sketch um, yeah. that she did of like, Newcastle showing the coal state. Okay. I'll try to find it. Oh, okay. it to Les. And also, Les, um, we've, I've just shared the link to your publication that's on the Living Histories platform. Yep. So anyone that's interested in, in having, um, having a look, it's been uploaded onto Living Histories. And I'll also put in the minutes and, and send out in an email to, to the group. Okay. Was that Anne speaking? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I, I missed uh, Anne mentioned somebody who might... Uh, or somebody who who's, it might have been, I missed that name. Did Isabella Parry. Oh, Isabella Parry, a uh, Parry's yeah. daughter. Yeah. Um, wife, I think. Wife, wife. Oh, wife. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which again, remains... there's a Port Stevens connection, so it would make sense. Um, yes, indeed. Um, if I could no, just, no. can you still see my screen, Joni? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. This is the last one I didn't mention, but this is a plate which is, is held by a family member. And the, that, that's the front on the back. It says, a wedding gift from, uh, from it, it, it's Lady Parry to yep, Elizabeth. That would be her. Yeah, on marriage to Thomas Peck uh, and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, so that would be her. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay. Well, you need... Can I make a comment? Look, yep. Look, uh, John Cromarty here. 
Um, by the way, uh, I've met no Cromarty uh, who pronounces it other than Cromarty. So um, that's just a point. I'm living in Geelong now. I was born at Raymond Terrace. I uh, went to school at Raymond Terrace, then Maitland Boys High School and taught in that area before shifting to Geelong. But there's just a, an interesting thing that I haven't, haven't shared with Les and we've been delighted to meet Les and to uh, join in some very good conversation in the last few months. Uh, that 300 acre land grant, Les, I, I haven't quite finished reading your book, but it was resumed as a naval base by the government, I think at the start of First World War or something like that. Um, but it was never really used for what they'd resumed it for. No. And um, uh, the, the state <clears throat> government, then, or the government then gave it back to the Port Stephens Council, I understand. And my dad became very upset about that. He said it should have been given back to the Cromarties. Mm. And uh, uh, I remember yeah. my dad then went to the Port Stephens Council. His name was John J uh, James Cromarty from Nelson's Plains near Raymond Terrace. And he fought the council to give him some of that land. He was a cromedy and he deserved to have it. And so the council then gave my dad an acre or two. And that would have been probably in the 1950s, I would say, or something like that. Ah. And dad then, my dad then, as soon as he got it, sold it and made some money out of it because he needed the cash. <laughs> um, we, we were dairy farmers. Uh, and Scots. And Scots. Yeah. And... Um, it was Scottish, of course. Of course, my second name is Macintosh. Um, and so, um, Les and I both uh, share um, Captain William Cromarty as our great great grandfather. But I just <clears> want to throw that in that little bit of a story uh, that the land was um, taken over by the government, but never really used for the purpose they took it over for. And Dad was very upset about that when they gave it back to the council and not the Cromarty's. Anyway, Thanks. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Les. Thanks, John. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Gioni, can I just mention, Les was wondering about Charles's um, uh, drawing and he's hoping that it'll be the fame on the end of the wharf. Um, yeah. If you look at it, the, the fame was a brig. And if I remember rightly, without going over and checking, brigs are two masters. So have a look at the painting. Uh, you're you're right. right. Charles put another uh, You know how to break a guy's heart. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure Charles can, can fix it. <laughs> you put, a, <laughs> put another put another mask on Charles. Yeah, put another mask on Charles and just <laughs> any oh, other no. questions or comments? I think we might we should uh, probably one, get Johnny. moving. Yep, yep, sure. If I can put one in. Um yeah, Lee, Ian Lee, Eckford, look, I really love the bit where he checked the surnames because it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't affect me so much being of Italian heritage, but all you guys you've got to be careful. <laughs> Very careful. <yeah. laughs> yes, well, I've been called everything from Cromarty to Cromarty to quality. To well, I'm sorry, I call you Cromarty, but I know now I I'm I'm, I'm, I'm corrected. It's Cromarty. And Cromarty. look, with Dumerisk, I used to call him Dumerisk too, but I was told by the former rare book librarian that it's Dumeric. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> yes. In the, in the same vein, you should have some of the troubles pronouncing Eckford over in the United States. Yes, uh, and I, I, can give you, I can give you great stories of how I've been called over the over time. Uh, uh, so, Les, I, 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 a few mispronunciations, but over to you, Ian. Yeah, yeah, Les, uh, thanks for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, my you. great, great, great grandfather, William Eckford, was a uh, Newcastle Harbour pilot from 1816 to around about 1821, 1822. That's right, yes. And uh, he, one of his tasks was to chase convicts as well. And um, yes. he used to take ships up the coast capture the ones that have been stolen and bring them back in That's right. one way or another. Um, the um, the interesting one of those interesting things, you showed that little card that was next to the plate that was presented and the yes. wedding was performed by um, Reverend uh, Wilton. Yes. And uh, he's one of the main characters in a book I'm writing about the early clergy in Newcastle too. Uh, and uh, he, he's got a really, really interesting history. He had a farm on an island in... Uh, in uh, the river and, and the harbour, and he called his property Kurigang, and of course that's um, that's become one of the local areas now for uh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Heavy, heavy industry. Um, to get a copy of your book, Les, I can correspond with you, or yes, please. Email, or what? Yeah. Yep, yeah, All just right. uh, send me an email, and um, I'll, I'll gladly oblige. Yep. Yeah, excellent. All right, I'll do that. Thanks, Thank Les. you. And and your um, is it three times great grandfather Eckford? Uh, 
I think he was he he worked until he was very old in the as the job of Harvester. I think I think he might have yes. been seventy or more. He was well in his seventies. Yeah, he came yeah. to Australia in 1801 yeah. and uh, died in 1833. But when he came to Australia, he was already 44. Yeah. So, uh, so he had a, had a fairly old age. And, yeah. Uh, no, and it's a nine, nice thing. Yeah. Nine, nine children too. So very oh, he's a very busy man. <laughs> very busy man. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Les. All the best. Thank you. All right. Well, look, I think we better wind it up there, unless someone's got a burning question for Les. I haven't got a burning question, Johnny, but can I just say... Um, oh, hello, Bernie. <laughs> um, lovely to hear your presentation, um, Les. I, I came in late, so I apologise. I just want to say um, hello to all of the other Cromedies in the room. It's so nice to actually have a, a meeting. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so obviously I'm, I'm, I'm a Cromedy as well, even though my married name is um, Drab. So um, yeah, it's just really nice to be talking about um, people that we've heard so much about. Um, yeah, obviously growing up hearing the the stories of Captain Cromedy and um, yeah, the, the whole sort of family history sort of coming to life now is wonderful. So thank you for all of your hard work you've put into it. Liz. Um, yeah, I thoroughly thank enjoyed you. your first book. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh yeah, that's the old I, one. Yeah. I, I read that with yeah, great passion and yeah, yeah, it's really lovely to see your your second book coming out. Terrific. Well, you'll see the, the next one soon. <laughs> Here's the Cromedy's joined us today all the way from Alstonville, to um, oh sorry uh, and, and Warhope right through Warrnambool uh, and Warrnambool the Warnable. furthest one hi Jill <laughs> hi how you going nice to meet you cousins I've never met before today yeah we're popping out of the woodwork <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wonderful thanks for the possibility of all this uh, Anne and Joni that's um, sort of a mini family reunion well it's getting... always we're I like pushing new ground with these sorts of things. It's been very interesting <laughs> trying to match the technology with the history and the connections. So it's it's uh, it's it's yeah. it's great. Well, I'm All right. Well, thank you so much. Well, 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 thank you very much for presenting, Les, and sharing your book with us too. I mean, it's fantastic that we've actually got a copy online for those who like online. I know not everyone likes reading things online. We also like physical things. So right. contact Les for the physical, but we also have the digital. So yeah, thank two you worlds. Much. And I will see you eventually. Um, I'm coming for sure. Okay. There's a physical copy at Newcastle Library. Yes. That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Les. Final round of applause, and then we'll try and get the rest of the business. Thank you all. Okay. Bye.